abide us now broken down in Jesus and though we are still different he makes us one one better than another we all need faith in Jesus for all he can save us he makes us one we are yours we belong every daughter every son we are one where the family are found the gentle Good morning. <laughs> it is so good to be with you all on this, the second Sunday of Lent. And this is the second Sunday of our special six-week Pulpit Swap Lenten series. So five free Methodist churches from across Canada will be gathering in their own places of worship to hear and reflect on the message that a different free Methodist leader brings us each week. This morning, Pastor Keitha from West Springs Church in Calgary will be sharing with us. Would you join me now in prayer? Gracious Creator, we thank you for the family of God. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for our neighbors, for our friends, and for our family. We thank you for this day where we can come together and worship you with one heart and one voice. We've come because you are worthy of all of our praise. Whether we have come from burdensome weeks, hectic weeks, weeks facing storms we hadn't even begun to imagine on Monday, or whether we are coming from weeks of victory and triumph, we come. Wanted to glorify and honor you. We come knowing that you are with us as close as our very breath. We come knowing that you meet us right where we are. Reveal your presence to us this day, O God of light, love, and glory, as you did to your servants at the foot of the mountain. Send your spirit to show us your story. May the brilliance of your face illuminate this place as we dare to proclaim your word. And may we, your people, be never unable to tell of all that we have heard. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to open as part of our call to worship with another uh, poem from Malcolm Geet. And it's on the transfiguration because that is the scripture that we have in our lectionary gospel reading today. And I'll have Stephen just, I think I've brought the poem up here. So I will read it, but then you can read along. For that one moment in and out of time, on that one mountain where all moments meet, the daily veil that covers the sublime in darkling glass fell dazzled at his feet. There were no angels full of eyes and wings, just living glory full of truth and grace. The love that dances at the heart of things shone out upon us from a human face. And to that light, the light in us leaped up, we felt it quicken somewhere deep within. A sudden blaze of long extinguished hope trembled and tingled through the tender skin. Nor can this blackened sky, this darkened scar, eclipse that glimpse of how things really are.
Would you join me now in our responsive reading as it appears on the screen? When the way is difficult and dangerous. When evil comes to break us down and break us apart. When power from on high strikes fear in our hearts. For we know that the love and power of God, which abides in us, will not be overcome. Let us continue in our worship through the singing of songs. You are welcome to stand. If you're more comfortable sitting, you're welcome to sit. You're welcome to dance. You're welcome to clap. However the Lord leads us worship this morning in spirit and in truth.
27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil doors assail, we need to to bear my flesh. My adversity that follows, they shall stumble and fall. Through an army and camp against me, my heart shall not fear. Through horror rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in the shelter in one day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifice with a shout of joy. I will sing to make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry out loud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face, your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You will have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me. O oh God, my, O oh God, my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me the way, O oh Lord, and lend me on the level path because of my enemies. Do not give up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have arisen against me. And they are all breathing out violence. I believe I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let the heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Genesis 15, 1 to 12, verses 17 and 18. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, and your reward, and your reward shall be great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? Give me, for I continue childless, and the heir of my house, Ezekiel of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. No one but my very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look upward to the heaven and count the stars, if you're able to be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from earth of the Caledons to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a male goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these things, and he cut them in two, laying each half against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. 
When the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down, it was dark. A smoking fire part and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I give you this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are <coughs> excuse me, expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our hum <coughs> humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand for in the Lord in, in this way, my beloved. Luke 9, 28, 43. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter, John, and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory, and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had just awakened, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with them. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and in those days told no one of any of the things they had seen. And on the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a great crowd met them. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. And suddenly, a spirit seized him, and all of a sudden, he shrieked. It convulsed him until he foamed at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, Your faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he, was coming, while he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. He healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God.
My friends, would you join me as we lift up our prayers for one another? And may the Holy Spirit remind us throughout the week to continue to be praying for one another. Let us pray. Jehovah Rophi, God of all healing, we thank you for the healing that Trevor has experienced, the miraculous healing. God, and we pray that that healing will continue until it is full and complete in Jesus' name. We lift up to you Donna Rennick this morning, God, who is in the hospital. And we pray, God, for her healing, for her strength, for her comfort, and for her peace, Lord God. We thank you that Irene, Lord, had her surgery. We thank you that Mary's brother, Lord, had his surgery. And it's a good prognosis, God. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the healing that those around us are experiencing. And we continue to pray for healing, Lord, for Miss Sue's eyesight, that it would be 2020 in Jesus' name. Whether by miracle or by medicine, God, we pray that her sight would be restored. We pray for Scott as he prepares to undergo eye surgery, God, that his sight would be restored and that it would be an easy surgery with very few complications, with no complications and a quick recovery. We pray for Miss Bonnie, God, as she prepares to go for surgery on her tear ducts. And again, we thank you that, Lord, you have given wisdom and knowledge to these doctors. And we pray that, Lord, you would give them clarity and steady hands and that healing would be experienced by all. Lord, we pray for Miss May, for her shoulder, that the pain would subside, that the symptoms would stop, and that she, God, would have comfort and peace, both in body and spirit and mind. Lord, we pray for Miss Gail. We lift her up to you, and we ask you, Lord, to move in a mighty way in her presence, making your presence manifested and tangible, giving her hope and courage and strength this day. We pray for Michelle and Dorothy as they prepare for transitions. We pray, God, that, Lord, you would give them comfort. Lord, help them as they enter into this new season. Provide for them Jehovah Jireh as only you can do. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are in the midst of us, that you never leave us or forsake us. We continue to thank you, God, that Jack and Clay are able to be with their grandmother and spend quality time, Lord, with her and the delight and joy that that brings her. Lord, we thank you and we pray for Pat Hale, God. We pray that you would be with her in this season, that she would know your closeness, your nearness, your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, 
We don't understand why some people get healed miraculously. Some get healed in a minute, some in a moment, some not this side of heaven, but we do know that through it all, you are with us. May that be a comfort and a strength to all. Lord, we pray for Miss Donna and Brad, and we pray your comfort and strength for them. We pray your healing. We love them, God, and we love each and every one who calls us their church home, and we just help us to be people of prayer and people of support, practical support, reaching out, learning how we can help, Lord God. We pray for Tanya, God, and we pray that she would know your presence as well, that she would experience it right now as she sits wherever you have brought her this day, and that she would know that she is loved. We pray for all those who are struggling with addiction, God, and we pray for freedom, God. We pray for the courage to resist the temptations that would seek to bring them low, that would seek to enslave them, God. Lord, that they would turn to you and find strength and freedom to resist. We pray for those, Lord, who are battling mental illness, God, and we ask you to bring light into the darkness, hope into the despair, to surround them with people who will support and encourage them, to bring healing, whether by miracle or by medicine. We pray for those places in our lives where there is dissension and disunity, broken relationships, and we pray for reconciliation, Lord God. That we would all find ourselves drawn closer to you and closer to one another. We pray for peace, God. Peace in our hearts, peace in our relationships, peace in our midst. We pray for peace in the Ukraine, God. We pray protection over those in Russia and the Ukraine who are suffering the travesties of war innocent lives lost over pride and ego and power. Lord, we pray for peace and help us to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, but peacemakers, God, who actively pursue peace in our own lives and relationships. Lord, as Keitha comes today to give us and share with us your word. May we have ears to hear, a mind to understand, and a heart to receive. But most of all, Lord, may your spirit speak to our spirit. And may we have the courage to respond. May we have the courage to live out what the spirit is calling us into. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. My name is Keitha Obuagu, and I am the lead pastor at West Springs Free Methodist Church in Calgary, Alberta. I'm one of the speakers for uh, Lent's beautiful gospel journey, and I'm really excited to share on today's passage found in Luke chapter 9. The Transfiguration is one of those pieces of scripture that leads pastors towards temptation. The temptation is to skip over it, to ignore it, or the temptation can be to overanalyze it. Over the past few weeks, I've been listening to podcasts, reading through articles and books, all related to the transfiguration, and repeatedly there is this underlying joke that the transfiguration is an unteachable passage. And then the secondary thing they always say is they caution against over reading the words on the page. To be honest, I've often skipped over this strange moment in the Gospels. It seems more akin to something rising out of a novel or a genre of text connected to the paranormal or science fiction, something otherworldly, hard to imagine and difficult to believe. Yet there it is, a text for us, the modern church, to wrestle with, to wonder about, and to sit within its mystery. Now, before we get to the glitter and the lights of this morning's text, I want us to take a few steps back to understand what is happening around Jesus during this time. The passage is bookended by a pivotal moment between Peter and Jesus, as Peter declares with boldness, 
that while some suggest that Jesus is a prophet, perhaps Elijah raised from the dead, Peter, he is confident that Jesus is the promised Messiah, the savior of Israel from Rome, the one sent to keep them from being the underdogs, the castaways, the ones who are forced to let go of their power. In essence, he's convinced that Jesus has come to transform the working class into the ruling class. Jesus hushes Peter's words and his sentiments with a reminder that he, the Messiah, has come to die. In some readings, this is the very place where Peter insists that the one who would liberate them and lead them toward the freedom they imagined cannot also be the one who would face the humiliation of the cross. This didn't sound like any kind of victory that they wanted to partake in. But as Peter insists that Jesus cannot and will not die, Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan. Stark words for Peter, stark words for us, stark words for the church. That we would try to create God in our own image? Did we attempt to force him to fit into our agendas and insist that God's power must emulate our own ideas, ideologies, and preferences? Things that are so opposing to the will of God that Jesus notes this sounds evil. And so he teaches another way. Jesus seems to say, if you want to follow me, if you want to be like me, if you want to fully understand who I am, what it means when you say that I am the Messiah, the one sent from God, well, get ready to do that which you never imagined to endure that which you never desire, to take on that which resembles death at times for the sake of life. His words are confusing and troubling and difficult both then and now. But it's this scene that precedes the passage. It's this idea that leads us to the transfiguration as about one week later, Jesus climbs a mountain with Peter and James and John and we note that Jesus has already begun to declare that he must die. He has forcefully noted the cost to follow, and then he invites the three to trek with him into a place of prayer. But those three disciples don't seem to get it. They don't seem so concerned or perplexed or worried. Instead, they fall asleep. They're sleeping while Jesus is wrestling in prayer. Now, I don't belittle them for sleeping. I, I, I'm not concerned that, you know, that they're failing to stay awake. After all, they cannot imagine what is to come. They cannot picture the, the agony, the inner struggle and turmoil that Jesus is experiencing as he simultaneously lives, breathes, and ushers in the kingdom of God, all tied up in the beautiful gospel. The good news that all will be made whole the good news that God's big idea is that we would both experience and co-create a world as it was intended to be, a world that's more equitable, a world that makes space for the last to become first, the least to both experience and participate in grandeur, that tools of war and power and oppression could be transformed into that which brings flourishing for all, a world that is both transformed and offering transformation. Yet Jesus knew that the vision of God that had been spoken of and prophesied about and promised would require him to break. It would require him to be broken, to die so that all could come to life. And so while Jesus prays, the disciples sleep. It's here right in the middle of what is and what will be, what is longed for and what is experienced, what is hoped for and what is coming, that Jesus' appearance is changed. His face glows, his clothes radiate light and become as though they are white. And suddenly there is Moses and Elijah, the voice of the law and the voice of the prophets, standing with Jesus in full glory and light. And Luke suggests that, that the three of them are having a conversation together, that they're discussing Jesus' exodus. What a word to throw around when Moses shows up to the party. Some of you may recall that the book of Exodus tells the story of Moses and the account of the Israelites being freed from the enemy, freed from slavery as they crossed through the Red Sea towards the Promised Land. 
Wright notes that in the new Exodus, Jesus will lead all of God's people out of slavery to sin and death and home to their promised inheritance. The new creation in which the whole world will be redeemed. The very thing that the law and the prophets promised, proclaimed, and destined is about to come together in real time, in flesh and blood, as the Son of God prepares for the cross. Yet even here in this moment, as the disciples yawn and rustle and slowly blink their eyes awake to this spectacle, this out-of-this-world out sight, we are reminded of Peter's declaration. You are the Messiah sent from God. You see, this isn't an ordinary moment. And Jesus is not simply an ordinary man. And as we go through the passage, the disciples are reminded yet again of the glory and majesty attributed to the one they simply call rabbi, as they hear these words through the clouds from whom they presume to be God himself. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. These words end this radical moment of heaven and earth colliding in full view of these three disciples. And I'm compelled to believe that somehow this moment is intended to give us a glimpse of something that we so often hear about and pray for, yet so often miss. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. And for just a moment, the disciples participate in and bear witness to the glory of God, the power of transformation that makes all things new, all things whole, all things as they were intended to be. And so for a moment, despite their own fear and their own expectations, their own internal creations and presumptions of what the Messiah must be, in this moment, they see Jesus as he is, for who he is one who is neither bound by the law, nor perfectly defined by the words of the prophets, nor fully understood by the disciples. Rather, we, alongside the disciples, experience for just a moment that Jesus is both in these things, over these things, and recreating these things to his glory and for our good. And so here as the clouds lift and God's voice booms through the atmosphere, we catch an impossible to categorize glimpse of shalom. God at work making all things new. A holy moment. You can imagine the walk down the mountain to be one of significant reflection. Hushed tones, deep pondering. The disciples understand that they have participated in something grand. They have witnessed that which they can barely comprehend. And so the next day, perhaps it is with the remnants of what they experienced still lingering in their minds and showing up in their reactions, the disciples find themselves surrounded by the crowds. Now, Jesus isn't with them, but as soon as Jesus appears, the crowds turn from the disciples and they face Jesus with this mix of hope and concern uh, that he had seen time and time again. A father fills Jesus in on all that is happening. The disciples are attempting to free his son from the demon that ails him, that which torments him. And they, the disciples, the healers, and all those who had promised more than they could deliver, could do nothing. Now Jesus is bothered. The people still wonder if Jesus is the Messiah sent from God. The miracles, the glimpses of the kingdom brought to life as the blind see, the lame walk, and the spiritually oppressed find freedom are still not enough. The disciples have experienced the glory of God. They have heard a voice from heaven, yet the things of earth still confound them. And I wonder if in this moment, Jesus is reminded of his conversation with Moses and Elijah, if he's reminded of what his death symbolizes and what it ushers in, the end to all the suffering, the end to all that looks like death. So wholeness, transformation, and flourishing become that which is for all who are so loved. So Jesus heals the boy. 
defeats the doubts of the crowds, and forgives the short-sightedness of the disciples. And once again, the people are in awe, perhaps akin to how Peter, James, and John were in awe on the mountaintop. As now that same glory is brought down to the mass. And once again, we catch a glimpse of that thing that we so often hear about, but so often miss, that the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. Now that phrase, the kingdom of God, is perhaps one that I fear I might use just a little bit too often. And that fear comes because I don't want us to lose sight of its importance, to lose sight of it as something that both is and is to, is to come. Something that is both divine and that which we in our humanity must participate in. Something that is and is not yet. You see, it's easy to rhyme off the kingdom of God as though it's simply something tangible and practical. But if nothing else, within this text, we see that the ideas of the kingdom are also mysterious. Fixed but loose, now but not, to, to be experienced, hoped, and longed for, all while experiencing, living, and building it today. It's this in betweenness, the both andness of it all, that can leave us as the church somehow deflated and discouraged rather than hopeful and rejoicing. On one hand, we have these beautiful personal and collective engagements with God where the divine and humanity seem to collide with beauty. And these moments are found in worship, in conversation, at the communion table, and even in simple acts of service. But when we raise our heads from prayer, or we walk back to our cars following a worship gathering, or move our eyes from scripture to the newspaper, from conversation with friends to our social media feeds, we can find ourselves discouraged and disheartened by real life. The everyday trials, wars and rumors of war, that which is dark and unfixable, that which longs to remove hope from our eyes. You see, we like the disciples find ourselves moving from a moment of glory to a moment of defeat as we come face to face with a father who simply longs for his son to be well. A man who simply wants the evil of this world to let his son go and all of our striving and trying and praying and calling down heaven to earth produces nothing more than, than sorrow and disappointment and the angst of the helpless father holding his helpless son. Now, before we get too far down this road, I just want to pause and I just want us to be clear that the point of Jesus's miraculous healings and engagements with the people are less about the individual and more about the whole. Each miraculous encounter is Jesus reminding us that in this world we will have trouble, but that he has overcome the world. Each miracle is an opportunity for the crowds, the disciples, the religious to gain a glimpse of the wholeness promise, the shalom that is and the shalom that is to come, the flourishing for all that we must pursue, the power of transformation that is inspired by our encounters with the divine. And so while we may not all face the literal helpless father holding his helpless son, we do face a declining church. We do see a more polarized world. We do hear the cries of injustice. We do experience the darkest parts of humanity made flesh among us. And there is a temptation. A temptation to believe that if we were just to pray a little harder and fast a little longer, if we could just give a bit more and experience a little less joy and embrace more suffering, that if only our faith could somehow grow from that which is microscopic to that of a mustard seed, that if we tried harder, if we worked longer, if we really, really wanted it, then maybe, just maybe, God's kingdom would come. Then maybe our hope would not be shattered. Then maybe our sights would be less frail. Instead, as the crowds marvel at Jesus healing the boy and thus healing the father, he turns to his disciples who once again are emboldened to believe that God will save them using all of the power and trappings and ideas that look and sound like them, rather than those things that look and sound like God incarnate, there is Jesus, 
And he reminds the disciples that despite his glory and his power and his majesty and his rule, he must still die. He too will face the, the darkest, the hardest, the most challenging parts of what it means to dwell among us. And that is in both his glory and it's in his humiliation that the kingdom comes to life. And so we pray and we seek out the spirit and we lean into scripture and we continue to be in community as the church and we bring our joys and our darkest sorrows to Jesus. Not because if we do these things and suddenly the hard pieces and the difficult moments are erased. Not because this will allow us to become the ruling class again. Not because this will allow us to regain our ideas of power and privilege and control. Rather, we participate in these means of grace, despite the dark, in the dark, knowing that the kingdom of God comes to life, despite the dark and in the dark, with the promise that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. And so it is for the church that both in our glory and in our humiliation, the kingdom comes to life. And so as the world questions evangelicalism, there's a temptation to assume that the questions, the concerns, the pushback are all negatives rather than signs of God at work. As churches walk into and among our communities and we find darkness and dishevelment, all that is broken, we can sense that this is a sign that God has forgotten us, that he's abandoned us, and that he's somehow forsaken us. Rather than noting the presence of us, our buildings and our resources may be just the sign that reminds our neighbors and eventually ourselves that God remembers the least of these. As we watch the news and hear the darkness of evil parading with its puffed up self, we often sense that this means that the glory of God is no longer among us, rather than hearing the whisper of God to the church, that we are invited to become the light, that we are invited to dispense the glory. It's so easy to forget or to cast aside the beautiful gospel that the kingdom of God is at hand, that the kingdom of God is near, that the kingdom of God has come because we live in the in-between. And we have these glimpses of a shining face alongside the glimpses of a helpless father holding a helpless son. And there in between it all is us, the church, not as a replacement for God, not as the good news, rather as ones who declare it is in him that we live and move and have our being. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit resides in us. The glory is in us, but it resides within us and it compels us, it invites us, and it leads us to become the light to be the voice, the hands, the feet of Jesus, that which both recognizes the power of the mountaintop and the power of the cross. The power in the glory and the power in the humiliation. All of it. Leading, pointing, inviting, and co-creating the kingdom of God among us. So while it's dark, we persist. When it's light, we persist. When it's heavy, we persist. And when it's easy, we persist. When enveloped by the glory of the mountain, we persist. And when devastated by the helpless father holding his helpless son, we persist. And in it all, when the church gets it right, and when the church is called to repent, when the church loves well, and when the church must be rebuked, so it will let go of hate. When we make space and those moments when we require a correction so we can tear down unnecessary walls. 
When we preach the gospel and when we are reminded that the good news is most beautiful when it is for all, when we lean on Jesus and when the Spirit stirs us to stop leaning in on religion, in all of it, that which is easy and that which is hard, that which is heavy and that which is light, that which is darkness and that which breeds glory, the kingdom of God comes to life even if it first leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. And so yet we persist. I read this um, um, little reflection uh, in a book called Feasting on the Word. Um, it is, it's edited by Barbara Brown Taylor and Kimberly Vandriel writes in the book this observation on the transfiguration. She says, Raphael's exquisite painting, The Transfiguration, presents a chaotic scene at the bottom of the canvas. Struck at the foot of the mountain, the disciples cannot cure the sick boy. Frustration is palpable in the outstretched arms and panicked faces of the crowd. In their midst, however, two figures point in the direction of the mountain, toward the sky, in which the transfigured Jesus shines arrayed in white. This is the Jesus who will come down the mountain, bringing life and healing to the boy. For the author of Luke's gospel, Jesus is the savior, not only of this young boy, but of the whole world. Yet it is often tempting to imagine that our world is beyond saving. Disaster persists. Brokenness, sin, and injustice threaten human life. Hope wanes even among faithful people. We need to point to the God who is at work transfiguring the creation, now marked by suffering and death. The transfigured Jesus becomes present to a community not fully awake to the promises of God. Through the gifts of worship and sacraments, prayer and fellowship, service and the work of justice and peace, the cloud of Jesus' glory envelops weary disciples. Here shines the one in whom there is power to overcome death. This is good news. As we go into this week, surrounded by the dark, yet fully aware of the light, as we encounter the glory of the mountaintop and the shadows cast by the helpless father holding his helpless son, a picture of all that longs to convince us that the kingdom of God is neither at hand nor near, may we, in the in-between of light and dark, of now and to come, of burden and ease, of longing for and living in, be courageous enough to point ourselves and others towards the Christ who declares that it is both in the light and the dark, the glory and the humiliation, the mountaintop and the cross, that the kingdom of God comes to life. May this, the curious, mysterious, hard to place and hard to swallow story of the transfiguration, compel us to declare as individuals as churches, as the people of God, that despite the in-betweenness and both andness of it all, yet we persist. Would you join me in prayer? Awesome and glorious creator, we could build grand edifices crafted out of our opinions of how you should act and be, God of mountains, or we could gather up all the broken dreams of the most vulnerable to build a more just world. We could join the denigrating chorus which ridicules all who have been pushed aside by those climbing to the top, dawn of hope. Or we could hear songs of reconciliation and hope of all who seek peace. We could avert our gaze from those who have fingers pointed at them because of where they come from. Spirit of love. Not who they are 
or we could catch a glimpse of you coming down from the closet shelf where we put you so you can be with us. When we could stay on the mountaintop, take us by the hand to lead us into service. God in community, holy in one. So a couple of things. Um, as I mentioned last week, on the third and sixth weeks of this six-week series, we're going to have a potluck after service, and we are going to discuss the different reflection questions that are offered to us each week. So if you're not sure what they are, they will be ma- emailed out to you ahead of time. So this, you'll get them for these three weeks. And then you can also at any point go on and watch the whole service on our YouTube or Facebook page. Um, and we will discuss them on next Sunday. So next Sunday is the third Sunday. It's a potluck. It's a potluck. Can I say that one more time? It's a potluck. So we're able to eat and join together. Um, So bring some delicious food. It's been a long time since we were able to really fellowship. So we'll do that and we'll discuss the questions. This week, uh, Keitha has offered us two options of questions. So These are the questions for reflection this week. What comes to mind when you consider the transfiguration? How do you define the idea of the kingdom of God? How does it affect how you live with yourself, with others, with your neighbor? And how does living in the in-between challenge your faith? What encourages you to persist towards co-creating wholeness, transformation, and flourishing for all despite the dark moments and experiences you encounter. So we have those reflection questions, but she also talked about Raphael's painting of the Transfiguration. And so this is a practice called Visio Divina. Some of you might have heard of Lectio Divina, where you wear, read a passage. Those who were part of a small group I had, we've done both of these, Lectio and Visio Divina. Lectio Divinia is when you read a passage of scripture, a short passage, a couple of times through, considering what words and phrases are popping out to you, reflecting on them, asking what the Holy Spirit is trying to reveal. Visio Divina works similarly, but with a picture. So like this painting from Raphael. So some of the questions for reflection as you reflect on this painting is, what is striking about this painting? How, if at all, does this image challenge or encourage you as you reflect on living in the in-between of glory and humiliation? And finally, what lessons can be applied personally or corporately as a church from the image or something that stood out in the sermon? So again, those will be sent to you by email. They're available by watching the service again on YouTube or Facebook. And so we will have great times of discussion and great times of food and fellowship next Sunday. One last thing before we partake in communion. Uh, Lola had called me and asked a great question. Lola had said, Pastor Kathleen, I really want to memorize scripture, and I'm just not sure where to start. What should I memorize? And I think there are so many options, and you can't go wrong regardless of what you choose. What I might suggest, and so I'm going to suggest this and offer it to you, I suggest memorizing the Sermon on the Mount. So if you want to take that up this Lenten season with Lola and memorize the Sermon on the Mount, that might be a good place to start. The Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to invite Miss Mary to come now, and we are going to prepare to partake of communion together. May the God of each dawn be with you. And also with you. Let us open our hearts to God who gathers us at this table. We delight in the grace which fills our lives. May we offer our praise to the one who calls us the beloved. We give thanks to our God of holiness. You took the shreds of chaos, the repair of all brokenness, and transfigured them into the mountains where we could draw closer to you. Valleys where we could serve your people, bright stars of each morning, 
These gifts and so many more were offered to the children of dust you called beloved. But we join death and sin in their conspiracy to make themselves more important than you in our lives. You waited for us to return to you, sending invitation after invitation through men and women of every age. But we continue to plot, listening only to foolish words. When you could no longer wait, you sent Jesus to us so we might take shelter in you. With those we have seen your glory, with those we hunger for your grace, we join in praising your name. Holy, holy, holy are you, God who offers shelter. We join all creation in your you. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the morning star of salvation. Hosanna in the highest. We wait for God to show up. And while waiting, we do not notice the words we might have spoken, the good we could have done. Our judgment often become clouded by our foolishness, sheltering God, and so we make all the wrong choices. We let fancy philosophies draw us away from your grace. The flowery words of politicians can lead us into valleys of worry and despair. Our fear can convince us that those around us are conspiracy against us. You can take all our foolishness, creative God, and make us wise enough to see you among us. We take the shrubs of the, our broken lives to recast us into a faithful people. You speak gently to us so we can listen to your dreams of our seeing each person as your beloved, even as Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, sees us through such eyes. Let us confess to our God, who waits to surround us with grace and hope. O Lord Jesus Christ, we come, and we confess that we have not always chosen the way of service to collective life. We have sinned against you and others. In our thoughts, words, and deeds, we have failed to love our neighbors and to varying degrees. We have ignored your call to be a blessing. We have mercy on, upon us, Lord Jesus. Forgive us our lack of love. And cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That we may walk in your ways. And serve you in grace and in love that we ask in your holy name. Amen. Our mountain tops and in valleys, in moments when our lives are shrouded, and as well as we reflect Christ's life, God is with us, declaring we are the beloved. In this moment, in every moment, may we place the grace of God, which comes and transfigures our lives, Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. You alone are holy God, who laughs at our foolish posture. And blessed is Jesus Christ, who came to tell everyone of your love. He could have remained seated in glory, but chose to walk with us down this path called life. You could have remained on the mountaintop, but came down to minister to all in despair of empty valley. He could have simply told us how we should live, but demonstrated genuine love by dying on the cross. So death's power might be broken by the grace of the resurrection. As we rejoice in your hearts, beloved, as we would listen to him with our souls, we speak of the transfiguring mystery called faith. Christ died, great is his power forever. Christ was raised as love conquered death. Christ will return to gather all the beloved to God. On the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his companions. He took bread, blessed it, broke it, 
gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, blessed it, shared it, saying, This cup is poured out, is the new covenant. Overshadowed us with your grace, we pray, as the Holy Spirit is poured out on us and the guests of this holy table. As you give us the broken bread to strengthen our service to others, may we offer hope to all surrounded by injustice. As your cup of life nourishes us, may we see each person, not as a stranger or outsider, but part of your beloved family. And when the waiting is ended, and the stars and mornings and evenings shine the way to your feast, we will join our sisters and brothers in forever singing your praise. God in community, holy and one, amen. In collective longing for a taste of your kingdom on earth, we join together and echoing the prayer of Jesus. Our Father in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Let us keep the feast. All of you who truly and earnestly desire to abandon your selfish ways, who want poor attitudes, hurtful words, and destructive actions transform so that you might be a better mediator of the blessings of God. You who are wanting to grow in love for God and others and to live in love and peace with your neighbors. You who are striving to walk in the will and ways of Christ. Draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and humbly make your honest confession to Almighty God. Come to the Lord's table, all you who love him. Come to the Lord's table and be at peace. As this next song plays, you're ready to come, receive the elements, and then take them back to your seat. I invite you to come up the middle aisle, go back on the outside aisles, and then we will receive the elements together. Wayne, the body of Christ came for you, the cup of love poured out for you. Rejoice. Miss Deborah, the body of Christ came for you, the cup of love poured out for you. Rejoice. Miss Eunice, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love for us for you. Rejoice. Richard, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love for us for you. Lola, the body of Christ given for you, the cup of love for us for you. The body of Christ given for you, take in remembrance of him. The cup of love poured out for you, take and rejoice, for you have been forgiven. And may the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storms. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again in through our doors. Go knowing the grace, love, and mercy of God go with you and share it with all those God brings into your midst. Amen? Amen. Save us. He makes us 
Now, man. 